Let's look at an example of using our SQL interpreter in detail. So here's an example. Let's say we want to fill in the blanks in the following interactive Python session, which is interpreting SQL. So here's uh, the kind of SQL we want to interpret. Here's the cities table that we defined before. In Python, we could have the same effect by creating a city class and then creating some cities, as we saw earlier. What we'd like to do now is write some Python that has the same effect as this SQL select statement. Select the number of nautical miles north of latitude 38 as a column called north from the cities table where the name does not equal Berkeley. So this select statement should give us how far north of Berkeley, Cambridge, and Minneapolis are. We'll do this by creating a select statement as a select object, passing in the appropriate arguments, and then executing it to give us the list of result rows, which we'll print out. Printing out the result rows should give us that Cambridge is 240 nautical miles north of Berkeley, and Minneapolis is 300 nautical miles north. Just as a reminder, here's what the select class looks like. It represents a select statement, and it takes columns, tables, and a condition on initialization. When it gets executed, it needs the environment in which it's executed. So feel free to pause and think about this for yourself. I'll start going through the answers in three, two, one. On initialization, the select class takes three strings, the parts of the select statement that come between select and from, between from and where, and between where all the way to the end. So to properly construct this select statement, we have to have a string which includes the expression for the column as well as the keyword as and the name for the column. We also need to pass in cities as the name of the table that we'll use as input. And finally, we pass in an expression as a string, name does not equal Berkeley, where notice that we're keeping the quotes that came from the original SQL expression, and uh, we have quotes within quotes in order to represent the fact that this is a string that happens to have quotes in it. So now we've correctly created a select statement. When we execute it, the first thing it's going to do is join the rows of cities, which means looking up this name cities in an environment that will hopefully give us all the rows in the cities table. So we pass in a dictionary where the name cities is a key, and the value is this list that we built already of city rows at which point executing it will list all of those city rows, filter them by this condition, and then project them using this column description to give us a new kind of row with uh, attribute called north, which will be set to 240 or 300. Another question for you. How many times is the built-in eval function in Python called while we're trying to s.execute in this environment. Remember, we're using eval in order to evaluate column descriptions and conditions. Well, to find out the answer, let's take a look. So what I have here is a file called x.py, which is going to create the city class, build some cities, and just as I said, create a select object which has the column description, the cities table that we're drawing from, and name does not equal Berkeley as the condition in the where. This none is here in order to say that we aren't specifying a sorting order. Okay, then we say for row in s.execute with cities bound to cities, 
we'll print the row. Let's first make sure that that works. Python3x.py prints out the two rows that we want. Now how do we understand how many times eval got called and what it got called on? Well, we can replace the eval function that's built in with one that also prints it out. So the built-in eval is just called eval. But now we'll define a new eval, which takes in an expression and an environment. And what it's going to do is print out evaluated this expression in. And instead of printing out the entire environment, I'm just going to print out the star, which is the entire tuple of columns that is representing the row that we're evaluating at the moment. Then in order to make sure that this still has the same behavior as before, we need to return what you get from calling built-in eval on this expression in this environment. Running the same example again, we'll run the same code, except for that every time eval is called, it will print. How many times does it print? You should think about that before I run it in 3, 2, 1. OK, so what happened? We evaluated name does not equal Berkeley in an environment that was describing a row that included Berkeley. Notice that since this will be a false, it did not then try to do anything with the column expression for that row. But for the row about Cambridge, it first evaluated the condition, found it to be true, so it evaluated the column description's expression. And uh, for Cambridge, it would get 42 minus 38 times 60 is 240 nautical miles north. We print out this row because we're printing the row every time we find a valid row. And then it's going to keep going. So the next part is to check the where condition for Minneapolis, and then we build a row for Minneapolis, and we print it out. So the answer to my question is five. There are five evaluations because there are three rows. Two of them get two evaluations. One of them only gets one because it gets filtered out. Now one last interesting thing to note is the order in which these appear. The filtering of Minneapolis doesn't occur until after Cambridge has been projected into the new table and the row has been printed out. Now why is this interesting? It's interesting because if you look at execute, it says filter first, then order, then make a row. So you might think, oh, we'll see all the filtering and then all the ordering, which there isn't any, and then all the evaluating of rows. But since filter and map are all lazily evaluated, you only actually perform the filtering when somebody wants the output. And when do you want the output? Well, that's when you need to actually print out a row. 